Would you believe there was a time in history when metal music didn't exist? These were known as the before times, when humanity had no outlet for its darkness and anger, other than bludgeoning each other in medieval warfare and joining weird religious sex cults. Humanity was lost and on the brink of mass rabid psychosis and cannibalism, until as fate would have it, toward the end of the 1960s we were saved. By fusing the atmosphere of classical music, the musicianship of jazz, the melancholy of blues, the flamboyancy of early rock and roll, the effects of the Industrial Revolution, a growing resistance to strict religious dogma, plus an amputation and a whole lot of drugs, a new element was born heavy metal. Now finally kids of this new generation had an outlet for their feelings of loneliness, anger, and wonder by yelling about drug trips and Satan. Since then heavy metal has evolved into a global subculture with one of the most dedicated and devoted fan bases to exist. Metal has grown into many forms over the decades, now with new subgenres appearing constantly and pushing the limits of metal further and further. Metal has had quite the eclectic history in its time and continues to cement itself as the greatest collection of noises that humans have ever produced, and walruses. But how did metal come to be what we know it as today? What were the influences and motivations for the great decibel deities who paved the way for the artists of today? Where did it start? Where has it gone? How did it get here? And where is it going? Well, today we will be exploring the entire timeline of heavy metal. The history, its story, and its current state. So headbang the like button, stage dive onto the subscribe button, and windmill the video to your friends. And if you're a fan of my videos, consider becoming a member of the channel. Membership started only 99 cents a month and every single membership really helps me toward buying Iceland. And with that being said, everybody pack into the magical phone booth and let's go back in time. We first travel back to Britain in the year 1968, a country still reeling with the impact of the Second World War and the growing effects of the heavy machine industry. Metal plants and factories were often the only job sources for low-income citizens. This combined with the obvious pollution and soullessness of industrial factories led many kids of that generation into a sense of isolation built up frustration, and heavy steel. It's in this time that the originators of the sound that would lay the groundwork for metal began. This year saw the births of Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, and Black Sabbath, three bands who'd become the driving influence for generations to come. Black Sabbath particularly is often credited as being the first heavy metal band to exist, being the first to have such blatant dark theme over their distorted, heavier rock sound. The dark vibe that Sabbath managed to capture was the result of several factors. All of the members were from the same bleak area and were fans of many forms of music. All of them were deeply religious but had interest in, in darker subjects and became inspired by horror films. All of them loved drugs. And guitarist Tony Iommi got two of his fingertips cut off in a factory accident. Determined to continue playing, Iommi made his own prosthetic fingertips which altered his way of playing, now being unable to feel the strings on two fingers. This resulted in heavier notes being played, as well as Iommi's interest in make, making the music sound bigger. Inspired by a combination of Gustav Holtz's Mars Bringer of War, a demonic nightmare from bassist Geezer Butler, and probably a fair amount of psychedelics, plus singer Ozzy Osbourne's terrified sounding vocals, the band created what many regard as being the first true heavy metal song, their title track Black Sabbath. Striking fear and terror into parents everywhere, heavy metal was born. And so was the phrase, because in 1968, rock band Steppenwolf recorded their classic Born to be Wild, which featured the lyrics Heavy Metal Thunder, very likely introducing the thought of defining that heavier distorted sound with metal in the public consciousness. Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, and Led Zeppelin would have varying degrees of popularity at the end of the 60s into the early 70s, but a new emergence of heavier music had begun. Britain wasn't the only place experimenting with heavier, more outrageous forms of music. We hop over to America at the beginning of the 70s, specifically Detroit, Michigan, a city similarly hopelessly bustling with the factory industry. Similarly, this led to another generation of kids feeling lost and hopeless, inevitably facing a life stuck in a highly industrial purgatory and the same fate as Willie Loman from Death of a Salesman. Deep cut reference for all you out there. Building primal resistance to this restrictive way of life, combined with the constant irritation of loud clanking big ass machines, led to the kids of Detroit wanting to fight back and take a stand against the expected. And they wanted to do it by getting on stage and screaming at people while losing their fucking minds. This wasn't the only place in America where kids were starting to experiment with faster 
noisier music, but Detroit bands like the MC5 and the Stooges issued in more wild and rabid performances, while the theatrics and horror imagery that would soon come to define metal came with Detroit legend and one of my favorite artists of all time, Alice Cooper. With a desire to create the villain of rock and roll, whose stage show would have the same effect as a priest watching The Exorcist, the Alice Cooper band began experimenting with wilder, heavier sounds while pushing their image even further. Alice was the first time general audiences were exposed to an artist that wasn't a bubblegum cheery good boy trying to make you smile. Alice wanted to scare people, and his shows began to regularly feature fake blood, decapitated dolls, straight jackets, and to this day, Alice Cooper's signature stage move is killing himself in all kinds of different ways. These are all clearly props, they may even seem tame now compared to some shows nowadays, but you gotta remember, this was America in the 1970s. These people were afraid of anything that cast a shadow and burned women for doing math. Seeing a guy on stage with weird makeup cutting a doll's head off caused multiple heart attacks back in those days. Thanks, Alice. Following Alice's lead was Kiss out of New York, who led the way in putting spectacle and shock value over talent. Kiss took stage shows to the next level, and while parents hated it and were terrified of Gene Simmons' tongue, rebellious kids everywhere became more fascinated with darker imagery and over-the-top performances. Kiss massively capitalized on their growing fame, making their image appear on pretty much every available item known to man, which did result in the band becoming far more known and crafted them as more than just a band, Kiss became a brand. And with brands, they're collectors. Kiss built a large and dedicated fan base dubbed the Kiss Army, a fan club, one that brought a sense of community to fans of heavier, wilder music. I would argue that the Kiss Army helped create the dedication and loyalty the metal community knows today, as it seemingly set the basis for uniting fans of loud, shocking rock music, giving them a passionate sense of community. While Americans were adding a sense of shock, sleaze, and aggression to this growing sound, back across the pond in jolly old England, heavy metal toward the mid-70s began to form in what we largely regard as the classic sound of heavy metal today. Metal godfathers like Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, and the greatest band to ever exist, Motorhead. This is a fact. If you don't think Motorhead is the greatest band ever, you're wrong. Sorry. <laughs> took the genre in new, exciting, and faster directions. Bands like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest added a new level of speed and melody to the sounds started by Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple, and adding over-the-top showmanship to their performances inspired by bands like Queen. Their live performances and more approachable form of metal pushed heavy metal into the mainstream focus and the heavy metal scene quickly started to grow. At the same time, metal was about to be taken into its grimiest direction yet with Motorhead. Fronted by God himself, Motorhead was conceived through a combination of whiskey, speed, and cigarettes. Motorhead took the heaviness of metal with the speed of punk music and dressed it in the look of a western outlaw. Motorhead sounded like a gunslinger getting in a bar shootout while smoking a cigar, and their authenticity attracted outcasts from all directions. Underground fans of heavy metal, rock and roll, punk, rockabilly, as well as bikers, gang members, and bar hags all agreed that Motorhead were fucking awesome and their aggressive in-your-face heaviness along with a singer whose blood type was 100% badass and sounded like an ashtray became a massive inspiration for bands worldwide to take the sound of heavy metal and rock and roll and push it even dirtier. Everyone from Black Sabbath and Judas Priest to the Ramones and the Sex Pistols took inspiration from Motorhead and they would be an early springboard for many genres to come. Though still considered weird outsider music, Heavy metal throughout the 70s grew exponentially, and everyone from Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Motorhead, Saxon, Raven, and many other emerging bands started getting interest from record labels, having their songs heard on the radio, and performing at major music festivals with loads of established artists of all genres. The 70s era is really when metal as we know it began to take form as the sound became more defined, dark, and shocking imagery became more of a defining point. And the fans all started to experience some weird neck Tourette's that would cause them to uncontrollably bang their heads to the music leading to the creation of the term headbanger. The 70s birthed many hard rock and heavy metal bands we regard as defining legends to this day. But as our timeline goes on and we enter the 80s, this is when shit starts getting real exciting. Out of direct influence from Black Sabbath to sound, doom metal was formed by the likes of bands like Pentagram and Candlemass. Doom metal basically takes the sound of Black Sabbath and makes it heavier, longer, and more drawn out, and often keeping the dark spiritual nature of the lyrics. Out of all of metal's genres, doom tends tends to stick the closest to metal's first incarnation. And yet it was at the same time at the emergence of the 80s that other bands would push heavy metal way past any presumed determined limits. At this time, although Satanism and evil shit became common in heavy metal, 
It was still treated as something to be fearful of. Metal talked about Satan, but it didn't praise Satan. So Satan decided that wasn't good enough for him, and he formed his own band, one that took the power of hell and wrapped it in leather, intensity, and heavy metal. I can't underestimate how influential Venom would come to be on the metal scene. They took what had come to be known as heavy metal and cranked it up to 666. Venom was as much about making your grandmother cry and piss herself as they were about playing music. They took satanic imagery and lyrics and fully embraced it. While Black Sabbath sang about Satan being something to be fearful of and stay away from, Venom was a fistful of Satan's fury punching you right in the dick. Venom also took the music and pushed it faster, heavier, and dirtier, and rawer, with vocals that sounded like a demon bursting through hellfire out of your bedroom floor and then setting your mom on fire. Venom played a major role in making fans want to see just how fucking extreme metal could get. Through the era of the 80s, metal would go from some weird burnout music for nonconformists to becoming a massive global force, seeing its most exponential evolution yet. Metal had now comfortably made its way into the public radio, furthering its reach and inspiring more weird kids everywhere to start making loud noises. The early 80s in Europe saw the rise of some of metal's first extreme bands, Hellhammer and its follow-up Celtic Frost from a small village in Switzerland, as well as Bathory from Sweden pushed metal even farther into darkness than Black Sabbath could have ever dreamed of. Testing things like choir chants, instruments outside of the typical guitar, bass, and drums, and a less defined, more raw sound. While they brought a whole new level of extreme rawness to metal, Denmark's merciful fate brought the embrace of the extreme from the growing underground and combined it with the cleaner harmonies, riffs, and singing of bands like Judas Priest and Deep Purple. Merciful fate served as a sort of bridge between what was becoming mainstream metal and underground metal. People who loved Iron Maiden but couldn't handle the rawness of Hellhammer could still enjoy Merciful Fate while being introduced to the more extreme. Singer King Diamond's ghostly-like makeup, penetratingly high vocals, and strong horror imagery grabbed the attention of everyone from isolated farm children in Bergen to kids smashing beer bottles in an alley in Los Angeles. Merciful Fate quickly joined the ranks of Venom in the list of bands teenagers actually thought were demons from hell. But while Europe experimented with the darker sides of metal, America took a very different approach and started doing some real weird shit. In the 1970s, a meteorite crashed into Los Angeles that vastly affected the local population. And according to scientists, that meteorite's name was Van Halen. Van Halen were a hard rock band from California that quickly began to blow audiences away with their insanely skilled playing and massive showmanship. Guitarist Eddie Van Halen would quickly become an inspiration to every guitarist on the planet with his insane playing and singer David Lee Roth took the idea of a frontman to an even bigger level, becoming one of the most bombastic frontmen of all time. Van Halen's focus on partying, having a good time, and their easily digestible music, along with their explosive live shows, made them one of the biggest bands at the beginning of the 80s. Van Halen inspired an entirely new generation of fashion-focused, sex-driven drug addicts to invest what little money they did have on tight pants and guitars. With an equal desire of wanting to be seen, wanting to play loud, and one in cocaine, bands like Motley Crue, Poison, Quiet Riot, and thousands more started the 80s wave of glam metal. Glam took the loudness and distortion of metal and dumped a vat of cheap makeup on it, striving to look as flamboyant and feminine as possible. Unlike previous forms of heavy metal, glam didn't focus on being dark and therefore quickly gained mainstream interest. Guys who had spent years surviving off of stealing food and street drugs from hookers were soon becoming mega rich rock stars and selling gold records. Suddenly, Hollywood club bands were regularly selling out arenas and conceiving fatherless children throughout the world. There was a major mainstream focus on metal, and in the 80s it became the biggest form of music in America. While the massive popularity of glam did bring new attention and boosted the popularity of many of the early trailblazers like Ozzy Osbourne, Kiss, and Judas Priest, it did also lead to quite a contentious period in metal history. Metal was bigger than ever, but the crazy aggressive motherfuckers that read comic books and drank beer while watching horror movies and listening to Venom, Motorhead, and Merciful Fate hated that big, fancy, flashy, tacky shit. The underground was bubbling with a new urge for speed, aggression, and intensity. Kids who loved the classic heavy metal bands, but who also loved punk and were allergic to hairspray, created their own bands to go against the commercial mainstream metal of shit like Cinderella. These were bands like Exodus, Metallica, Slayer, Testament, 
and Anthrax, some of the pioneers of thrash metal. Thrash metal took the speed and aggression of punk music and combined it with talent. The heaviness and imagery of Motorhead with the guitar riffs and melody of Maiden and Priest. Born out of aggressive opposition to the extremely strict Christian conservative society of the 1980s, thrash was the yin to glam's yang and they did not get along with each other. If you showed up to an Exodus show with your hair all done up dressed like a coked out model wearing a Motley Crue shirt, <laughs> At the time, thrash was the most extreme of the metal scene and helped catapult the crazier bands we know today. It's through thrash that moshing was introduced to the metal world as a gracious gift of solidarity from the punk scene. Thanks, guys. While the sparkly hair bands were dominating arenas around the world, thrash was establishing the metal underground in clubs and venues. But whether you were into stage diving at an Exodus show, getting up and punching your friend in the face, or ODing in a dumpster outside of a Motley Crue concert, everyone can agree that metal music flourished throughout the 1980s. Shit, most of the bands you regard as legends are probably from this decade. It's in this era when many of metal's most significant moments occurred. Black Sabbath famously fired Ozzy Osbourne due to substance abuse issues, and in his absence recruited former Rainbow singer Ronnie James Dio. Though having massive shoes to fill and being a tiny man himself, Dio would come to have a seismic influence on heavy metal. His voice was an angelic sound straight from the heavens, and his lyrics and sap took a much more whimsical approach. And it's through our lord and savior Dio that the mighty devil horns was brought to the heavy metal world, something he decided to incorporate into Sabbath to help differentiate himself from Ozzy, and being inspired from his very religious and superstitious grandmother. The superstitious nature of the hand gesture quickly garnered massive attention and appeal, now obviously being an immediate key symbol of rock and metal culture. Another game changer to appear in the 1980s was tape trading. You kids watching right now won't believe this, but there was a time before the internet. <laughs> No way! And in this medieval age, music didn't come from tapping on your phone, but on these things called cassette tapes. These were far more durable and portable than actual records, and metalheads around the entire world began trading tapes with each other through the mail. They would take a band's demo tape and tie it to a pigeon, training it to seek out anyone with white sneakers and a bullet belt, but whenever that didn't work out, they used the postal service. Fans of the metal underground created their own independent magazines, and would post newspaper ads about bands, and would agree to trade a slave demo tape to someone who could get them a Celtic Frost tape. Tape trading played such a massive impact in spreading heavy metal, especially the underground of it, to audiences worldwide. People in Asia could now hear Anthrax, Australians were introduced to Slayer and Venom, and South America especially would become a particularly rabid market for metal music. Heavy rock and metal music exploded in places like Brazil when they got to hear the sweet, sweet sounds of Iron Maiden. In 1985, a massive music festival started in Brazil called Rock in Rio. This shit was fucking nuts, with one and a half million people in attendance, having their minds blown by Ozzy Osbourne, Iron Maiden, ACDC, Queen, Scorpions, and others. Rock in Rio played an unbelievable role in introducing metal music to this side of the world, giving metal bands the chance to play to some of the biggest audiences ever. Metal's influence took hold, and now bands from outside the usual market were putting their mark on the scene. Naturally, it didn't take very long for some bands to push the brutality even further than thrash. California's Possessed, members of the Bay Area Underground, had quickly increased Thrash's rawness with vocals that sounded more like Venom than Iron Maiden. Sepultura proved Brazil can play extreme metal, but over in the swamps of Florida is where metal really formed its most brutal and intense genre yet, death metal. Death metal came to be when someone dropped a Slayer tape into a swamp in Florida and an alligator ate it. Naturally, the metalhead who dropped it dived on top of the alligator and fought it till it coughed up the tape. And when that metalhead went to play it again, it sounded like obituary, and thus, death metal. Bands like Morbid Angel, Obituary, and Death began taking thrash and tuning everything as low and distorted as possible, including the vocals. These bands were heavier grimier, and more brutal than anything anyone had seen. It's here where the deep guttural vocals that have become so synonymous with metal were defined. It's also in the meth swamps of Florida where metal lyrics and imagery got even more fucked up because it's Florida. Many metal bands up to this point sang about death and violence in their songs, but it was usually a little more tongue-in-cheek like describing an action movie. 
Death Metal was a lot more blatant with its lyrics, and I would like to read you an example right now. Ahem. Eyes bulging from their socket, with every swing of my mallet. Smash your fucking head in until brains seep in. Through the cracks, blood does leak. Distorted beauty, catastrophe. Steaming slop splattered all over me. Beautiful writing, it almost brings a tear to your eye. The Florida Death Metal scene became a thriving underground, giving you some of metal's heaviest and most grotesque bands to this day. And back in Europe, metal was continuing to evolve. Germany especially began to cement itself as a heavy metal stronghold. Like the US, Germany developed a strong thrash scene with bands like Creator, Sodom, and Destruction blowing up the underground. While Germany was building its name, metal's birthplace of England was also seeing how much further they could push things. Spawning from the conceivement of thrash and death metal's heaviness and the chaos of hardcore punk, metal's most experimental and bizarre genre, grindcore, was vomited onto the scene. Bands like Napalm Death, one of my favorites, and Carcass took the brutality and grotesqueness of the new emerging death metal scene, stripped it of its musical structure and replaced it with the chaos of punk. Grindcore had no interest in playing guitar solos or choruses or any of that pussy shit. Grindcore was about how much chaotic noise you could make in a short amount of time. It's a true test of how far the sound barrier can be pushed and challenges what's considered music. It also sounds like dog shit, or at least some of those really early albums do. At the same time, other musicians were taking the speed and intensity of established bands and taking it in a more lighter and whimsical direction. In the early 1980s, a German wizard deep in the forest of Hamburg took the speed and vocals of Judas Priest, the lyrics of Iron Maiden, and dumped it into a pot along with the Lord of the Rings books and seasoned it with helium. Stirring this big magic pot, the wizard poured it on the floor and the liquid formed into the bands we know today as Halloween, Blind Guardian, and Gamma Ray, pioneers of what's known as power metal. Power metal took the exciting, over-the-top, and bombastic parts of metal and made it about fantasy tales and stories. Largely inspired by Ronnie James Dio, most power metal songs are very fast with extreme melody and have lyrics about fighting dragons, mystic journeys, and having sex with elves. If you liked heavy music and vocals that sounded like Rob Halford stubbing his toe, but would rather hear songs about Frodo, Dungeons and Dragons, and being a virgin, then power metal was your bag, baby. So all throughout the 1980s, metal thrived in every direction, and it was glorious. Glam had its time, thrash and death metal came onto the scene, but as we enter the 1990s, it would be a different story. As the Clinton years took hold, metal would find itself under another seismic shift. Glam metal's rise to popularity was short-lived, and suddenly bands like Rat and Quiet Riot weren't selling like they had been. The arenas stopped selling out, the drugs dried up, and too many band members OD'd on hairspray. Glam metal's time in the sun was up and the American mainstream turned their attention to emerging grunge bands like Nirvana because in the 90s everyone was depressed. If you watch a lot of documentaries on heavy metal, especially American ones, most if not all of them will say that grunge killed metal in the 1990s. Metal died in the 1990s. In the 1990s, metal expired. And I'm here to tell you that that is bullshit. Not surprising America would think it's the center of the universe. While it is true that as the 90s dawned, metal lost mainstream attention in America, many bands began playing significantly smaller venues than what they'd come to expect in the 80s, metal did lose a lot of attention in America, in the mainstream. But any underground extreme metal fans in the 90s probably had a pretty goddamn good time. Even in America, metal didn't die. The Florida death metal scene was its most active at this time, bringing killer bands like Cannibal Corpse and Deicide onto the scene. Death, after pioneering death metal, would release some of their most influential albums in the 90s that would go on to spawn a new genre. In the beginning of the 90s, bands like Dream Theater began creating the genre of progressive metal, which is metal for people who love doing math homework. Very structured, complicated, usually softer than many other forms of metal. At the same time around the early 90s, industrial metal was taking form. Ministry, Nine Inch Nails, Godflesh, and Fear Factory were some of the leaders of the earlier 90s to fuse metal's heaviness and guitar riffs with repeated program beats and sounds like listening to Morbid Angel while you shove a screwdriver in a dial-up computer. These bands took a lot of the imagery and shock value of someone like Alice Cooper, but with music that was far more crushing and sometimes danceable. Two bands to adapt this hybrid and come out of the 90s to become huge are White Zombie, fronted by Rob Zombie, and Marilyn Manson, both becoming horror and metal icons right along with Ozzy Osbourne and Alice Cooper. And if we expand to a more global lens here, we will see how metal certainly did not die in the 1990s. Let's go to Norway, where metal's most sinister subgenre was about to literally explode onto the scene. 
Through the influences of the vast, open, and isolating countryside, combined with teenage resentment and rebellion and some Hellhammer and Venom bootlegs, what would become known as the Norwegian black metal scene was emerging. Mayhem, Dark Throne, Immortal, and Satyricon were some of the first of this new demonic genre. Black metal took the satanic themes that had been prominent in metal up to this point and increased it tenfold. Satanic themes in metal had always been a bit cartoonish, more tongue-in-cheek. Even Venom, though more extreme, still had an element of satire to them. Black Metal's lyrics, on the other hand, were much more of a hostile, often murderous resistance to Christianity. The sound itself was much rawer and dirtier due to the fact that all of these artists were broke and couldn't afford good equipment. Back in these days, you couldn't just record a decent demo on your phone really quick. Mayhem's early demos came from putting one mic in the middle of the room and hoping it didn't sound like complete shit. Black Metal's purpose was to be raw and disgusting. It wanted to be ugly. To be as off-putting and terrifying as possible. Black Metal also took its own approach to stage theatrics. Alice Cooper and Kiss had spilled fake blood countless times at concerts already, but some of the early black metal musicians were eager to spill their own real blood for the sake of shock value. Black Metal took the metal world even darker than it already had been, quickly gaining attention for some of its members' newsworthy actions of killing each other and burning churches down, rather than the band's actual music. When I was growing up, the 90s black metal scene had this mythos to it, where you wondered if these bands were truly evil, bloodthirsty demons from hell that were sacrificed and goats backstage at their concerts, and some of those artists did take that more literally than others. Black metal made metal terrifying again, and parents developed a whole new fear of what their kids were listening to. Black metal wasn't just restricted to being about Satanism, however. The music was also birthed from an influence of Norway's landscape and Nordic history, creating an atmosphere of lo-fi distortion representing the melancholy of its isolation. Lyrics were also about the Norse gods, philosophies, and nature, bringing the old blood of the pagans into the metal ethos. Black metal quickly became a dominating force in the metal underground, but Scandinavia as a whole was asserting itself as the region of metal in the world. In the 1990s, Sweden developed their own death metal scene and style with some of my favorite bands in all of metal. Sweden's approach to death metal was more melodic than Florida's, with some bands feeling closer to metal's classic sound, but with this extreme modern edge. Sweden had its great underground death metal scene that was along the classic sounds of Deicide and Cannibal Corpse, but melodic death metal is really where Scandinavia put their own swing on the death metal scene. Largely inspired by Heartwork, an album by grindcore band Carcass, who decided to learn how to actually play their instruments and write well-constructed songs, and created an album that was as melodic in its playing as it was heavy, while still being death metal. Thus, bands like At The Gates, Dark Tranquility, and In Flames took that sound and continued to evolve it. For the first time, death metal was now catchy. Fans were starting to jump to the music like it was a pop concert. Singers were discovering harmony with screaming, and death metal guitarists started to be revered as guitar virtuosos. Although they are both death metal, you'd instantly be able to tell the difference between a Dark Tranquility song and a Cannibal Corpse song. It's also important to note that throughout the 1990s, music festivals exclusively catering to heavy metal were just starting to take off. Dynamo Open Air started in the Netherlands in 1986 in a small parking lot. In the 90s, grew to a festival so popular that the festival had to limit their capacity going forward. Wacken Open Air in Germany, Grasspot Metal Meeting in Belgium were just some of the festivals to set up their first stages in the middle of an empty field to a bunch of alcoholics in the 90s and have since gone to become the metal meccas we know them as today. So metal was plenty strong in the 1990s. And even going back to America in this time, a new form of metal would soon emerge to grab the media spotlight and introduce a new generation of outcasts to heavier music. As glam metal fell out of the billboard charts and people stopped stealing their sister's makeup to look cool, American youth's musical interest became filled with the likes of alternative, boring people music like Nirvana and the rise of hip-hop and rap music, which at the time was actually awesome and was quickly taking over the main consciousness. Teens in the 90s who'd grown grown up with their dad's Black Sabbath and Slayer albums, were also listening to Soundgarden, Dr. Dre, Alice in Chains, Ice Cube, Eminem, as well as the earlier goth and industrial bands like Godflesh and Ministry. And when all of these influences got shoved together in a high school locker in the 1990s, out fell new metal. One of metal's most controversial subgenres yet. The emergence of new metal came with bands like Korn, Limp Bizkit, with many singers actually rapping over their harder music. And much of the imagery looking like some sort of 
of neo tech rapper that fell in a vat of black nail polish and zippers. New metal probably took the most leniency out of the subgenres when it came to a lot of the classic traits many came to define with metal at this point. Actually, image wise, it took a lot more from the goth scene than it did heavy metal, and its lyrics focused more on teenage and outsider angst and emotions than they were about parting with Satan and killing people. From the mid 90s to the early 2000s, new metal became fucking huge in America. This is the time when I first started discovering metal music, and believe me, everyone I went to school with was listening to System of a Down, Korn, Slipknot, Deftones, Kitty, and so on. Everyone wore dark eyeliner and had spiky hair and jink pants. Despite its quick popularity, a lot of people hated new metal, especially underground extreme metal fans who had been listening to Obituary and Mayhem this whole time. Understandably so, new metal was basically claiming to be heavy metal while turning what people knew about it on its head and modernizing the sound, and taking major influences from genres that were clearly not heavy metal. But despite its controversial nature, new metal really did help usher in a metal renaissance in the American mainstream. The rise of Rob Zombie and Marilyn Manson as massive rock icons brought new interest to the likes of Ozzy Osbourne and Alice Cooper. Bands like Korn and Slipknot would talk about how influential Sepultura, Slayer, and Anthrax were to their music. And in this time, Ozzy Osbourne started Ozfest in America his traveling metal festival that brought more underground bands to massive crowds all across the country, with bands like Slipknot, Lamb of God, and Marilyn Manson attributing much of their success to OzFest. From the end of the 1990s into the 2010s, heavy metal as a whole, in my opinion, was at its peak. This was the best era of metal. The metal icons Ozzy Osbourne, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Motorhead, Slayer, and so on were finding new younger audiences to help lift them back up to the pedestals they deserved, and many of them were still putting out killer music. New metal bands like Slipknot were intriguing a new generation and selling out arenas. Meanwhile, the metal underground really took the form we know it as today. Death metal, black metal, grindcore, thrash, doom, power metal, all these genres of metal were peaking. Bands had really honed in and defined their sound. It was clear by the 2000s what a death metal fan was, what a black metal fan was, what a power metal fan was. And thanks to this new invention that became really popular called the internet, metal music became more widespread and accessible than ever. Thanks to illegal pirating that bankrupted your favorite bands, now any metalhead in almost any place in the world could find a vast, unending array of different forms of metal. And metal fans everywhere began to challenge the limits of this music by incorporating more elements of their culture and traditional instruments into the music. Sepultura started this experiment in the mid-90s, bringing in the instruments of Brazil's indigenous people into their thrash music. In the early 2000s, this idea would explode across the world in Finland with metal's funnest genre, folk metal. Folk metal is what heavy metal would sound like in Middle Earth. Take metal and add in violins, flutes, accordions, hurdy-gurdies, alcohol poisoning, and folklore, and you've got folk metal. Folk metal bands like Fintrol, Munsaro, Korpiklani, and Ensifirum resonated with metal fans with a hard-on for Viking folklore and mythology. One folk metal song could be about an ancient legend told in the Eddas that makes you feel like you're sailing down a misty sea in a Viking ship, and the very next song could be a really stupid pulky humpa band about getting so drunk after pillaging a village that you pissed on your girlfriend and had sex with a goat. Folk metal brought a strong sense of fun and lightheartedness, but also a love of nature, culture, and bonding to the metal world. Folk metal concerts can be absolutely wild and hilarious, with fans moshing, headbanging, dancing, jumping, smiling, and even rowing. Folk metal encourages fun and drinking. Symphonic metal also grew to prominence in Europe in the early 2000s. Finland's Nightwish, one of my favorites. Epica from the Netherlands. Sweden's Therion took the speed and heaviness in metal and married it with film score symphonies and operatic vocals. Metal had long been influenced by classical maestros like Wagner and Mahler, but this was taking that very form of music and directly incorporating metal into it. It's metal for smart people who are afraid of dirt and would rather drink Pinot Noir than Paps Blue Ribbon. Speaking of cheap knockoffs, in the early 2000s, metalcore also came onto the scene, which took the breakdowns and slamming drop beats of hardcore punk and brought in screaming, singing, and guitar riffs. In the early 2000s, these were bands like Killswitch Engage, Bullet For My Valentine, and August Burns Red that exploded quickly onto the scene, much to the dismay of many metalheads like myself. Moving on. As the 2000s went on, death metal itself would continue to expand in new territory with the rise of technical death metal, or tech death for short. 
Spawned out of Death's last few albums, which took a much more progressive and technical approach to their death metal sound than the thrashiness of their earlier records, bands like Necrophagist, which challenged the death metal sound with intense focus on musicality. And soon this sound combined with metalcore. I guess they had sex in a gas station bathroom one time, and that led to deathcore, a genre that at the moment is really fucking big right now. I know a lot of metal fans right now are hyper-focused on this genre, started by bands like Suicide Silence and Job for a Cowboy, leading up to now with Lorna Shore, Carnifex, Of Sulfur, and Slaughter to Prevail. Deathcore's main focus are on ridiculously heavy breakdowns, crazy structures, and neck tattoos. And that pretty much leads us to now, heavy metal in the 2020s. For me, it feels a bit like a shifting point in the metal timeline. On one hand, metal is bigger than ever, with countless bands influenced by this music playing to massive audiences. Metal is far more accessible and accepted nowadays. A teenager wearing a Cannibal Corpse shirt at their school probably isn't looked at as weirdly nowadays as they used to be. Metal festivals can now be found throughout the world. Some of them attract crowds the size of the Romanian army, and all of them bringing together a sense of community and celebration of metal. At the same time, I do feel a sense of unease with our present state. We're at a time where metal heroes are starting to pass away and retire. Dio and Lemmy, two of the biggest icons and godfathers of this entire genre, passed away in the 2010s. Slayer has retired, Black Sabbath has retired, and the rise of social media and technology has dissolved a lot of the mysticism that made metal fun in those prehistoric days. Before everyone was online, many fans thought that King Diamond really did sleep in a coffin, or that death metal musicians really did just kill people for fun or that a black metal band would really sacrifice your girlfriend on stage, or that a power metal band got laid. Nowadays, obviously, people aren't so naive thanks to Constant Connection. Also, the state of the music industry, especially metal right now, has made it so bands aren't making anywhere near as much money as they deserve. But that deserves its own video, and this one's already way too long, so I will expand on that later. Part of me does long to be back in those glory days of the mid-2000s, and all of me wants the current state of the music industry to get so much better for artists and fans, but that's not to say there aren't exciting things happening now and coming in the future. There are newer metal bands out there currently climbing the ranks and becoming major forces in the scene. Slipknot have become one of the biggest bands in the entire history of heavy metal. Death metal bands like Amonomarth and Gojira, Gojira's kinda death metal, now headline arenas. I couldn't fucking imagine a death metal band playing an arena when I was young. Ghost is another massive metal band packing stadiums around the globe and keeping metal satanic imagery alive. Bands like Ginger and Spirit Box have quickly gained massive followings for their interesting technicality and range of different musical styles challenging what extreme means to metal nowadays. Sabaton and Powerwolf are blowing huge audiences away and, and keeping the spirit of the metal sing-along alive along with explosive live shows. At the same time, old people like me still have some of our legends for now. Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, and Alice Cooper are still touring, which makes me very happy. Respect your pioneers, motherfuckers. The underground is also still thriving very well. Bands like Frozen Soul, Gate Creeper, and Crypta are leading the charge for a new wave of that classic death metal sound I love. Black metal, though largely demystified nowadays, is still giving us amazing albums Dark Funeral, Black Beard, and Cold. Thrash has a loyal fanbase that are still dedicated to going to every single Exodus and Testament show. Some bands like Anthrax, I think, are playing better than ever, in fact. Metal has a long, intricate, and impactful history that continues to evolve to this day. And one band I'm excited to lead the way in this new time is Dark Insanity. They're the greatest metal band of all time, and their singer is really sexy. Dark Insanity is my band. Check us out in the last video I posted from our debut show. <laughs> We're playing August 19th at the Doll Hut in Anaheim, and we're playing the Tulminator Festival next year in Slovenia. If you like the video, consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, and sharing to your friends, and maybe even becoming a member of the channel. And shout out to my first Rockstar members, Scars of Oblivion from Spain. Go check out those guys. They have a kick-ass album out. Thank you guys for the support. Check out my live streams, Why It's Metal Podcast, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. California time. Any and all of those are greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching if you made it this far, and I will see you all in the next video.